This video, we're talking about androgenic antagonist. So these are drugs that oppose the sympathetic activity. And we're gonna look at all the different receptor types in the, the androgenic receptor types. And we're gonna see which drugs are selective to which and what indications that might work out for. So first I wanna talk about blood vessels. So our blood vessels have smooth muscle in the lining um, and if you stimulate that smooth muscle with norepinephrine, for example, it will bind to alpha-1 receptors and it'll cause vasoconstriction. If that particular blood vessel has beta-2 receptors, it will cause vasodilation. So there's different densities of these receptors different places. If you think about it, if you're in a fight or flight situation, you want a lot of blood flow to your muscles, your brain, your heart. So those blood vessels leading to those particular organs will um, have a higher density of beta-2 receptors and they'll be stimulated with sympathetic fight or flight situations. Whereas our gastrointestinal tract, we're not worried about digesting food if we're in a fight or flight situation. So in those situations, there's a high density of alpha-1 receptors in the smooth muscle that bind to the norepinephrine and that's going to cause extreme vasoconstriction and close off that blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract and shun it to areas that we need it. So I want to talk about that. So alpha-1 receptors with sympathetic activity, it causes vasoconstriction. Also, when alpha, there's alpha-1 receptors on the internal urethral sphincter. So our bladder has a sphincter that it... Um, either opens or closes to kind of facilitate or uh, restrict blood, uh, urine flow. So with, with norepinephrine binding to the alpha-1 receptors on this internal urethral sphincter, it's going to cause constriction and it's going to prevent uh, urine outflow. So that's another thing because we're not worried about urinating when you're in a fight or flight situation. And then Another place we see alpha-1 receptors is in the, the sphincter pupillae, which is a muscle that dilates your, pu uh, your, your pupil. So um, those are three I wanted to make note of because there's, there's medical indications for each. So alpha-1, um, we could take drugs that are alpha-1 selective. That means that they primarily block alpha-1 receptors. Now they may have some effect on all these receptor subtypes, but they're going to be more selective for alpha-1. And that would be like Tamsulosin, which is Flomax, or Prazosin. There's other ones. Notice they all kind of have this osin suffix. So let's say you have a big honking um, prostate gland. So it's called benign prostate hypertrophy. Hypertrophy because it's, it's grown up. So if you're a male, your urethra passes through the prostate gland. If that prostate gland is getting big, it's going to encroach on that lumen where your, your urethral outflow goes. And so if you can relax that internal urethral sphincter, you can relax that tension through that urethra, and it'll help with getting maximum flow. Therefore, the name of it's Flomax or Tamsulosin. So that's a great drug if someone is having urinary retention secondary to BPH. Vasoconstriction. So if you're causing vasoconstriction of both the arteries and the veins, which, which is there's alpha-1 receptors on both, then it, you're going to result in total peripheral resistance increasing. So if you block alpha-1 receptors, you're going to decrease peripheral resistance, therefore decreasing blood pressure. And I want to make a note here that this isn't the first line drug for blood pressure, but let's say that you have a patient that has high blood pressure and they have BPH, that would be a, a, the best usage or best situation for this drug to be used because you're going to kill two birds with one stone. And then um, the only note to make about pupillary dilation is if you're taking alpha-1 blocker, you're preventing this pupillary dilation. And if someone's having cataract surgery, which is a pretty um, common surgery for the older population, if they're taking these drugs at the time they have that surgery, it could re result in a prolapse and cause some big issues. So hopefully their ophthalmologist will be on top of this, but it's still good to know um, you don't want a patient going into a cataract surgery on these alpha-1 blockers. 
alpha-2. There's not a lot of drugs that affect this. I, want to do, I do want to tell you kind of the purpose of the alpha-2 um, receptor subtype. So let's say you're in a fight or flight situation. The last thing you want is to worry about digesting food. So there's a lot of alpha-2 receptors on the, um, uh, the neurons that release norepinephrine into the gastrointestinal tract. And so basically on the axon terminal of the actual neuron that releases norepinephrine, there's a lot of alpha-2 receptors. So that when norepinephrine is released in a fight or flight situation, it comes back and binds to those and then prevents further release of uh, norepinephrine. Therefore, you're going to um, decrease um, the effects in, throughout the GI tract. But um, there's not really a whole lot of drugs there. Now, I made another video looking at pheochromocytoma, which is where you have a tumor of the adrenal medulla gland. And um, there's two drugs, phenoxybenzamine and fentolamine, that are discussed in that video that are kind of um, uh, block both of these. But I, I didn't want to talk about them too much in this video because I made a whole video for those. So you can go watch that if you're interested in those. But they're still considered androgenic antagonists, phenoxybenzamine and phentolamine. All right, so let's move to beta-1 subtypes. Two main places for this. One is the heart. So on the heart, we have nodal cells for SA node or AV node, and there's a lot of beta-1 receptors there. So in a sympathetic fight or flight situation, you want to increase your blood pressure, your heart, your, your uh, cardiac output, and so you want to increase your heart rate. So beta-1 receptors, when stimulated by norepinephrine or epinephrine, will uh, increase heart rate. And then we also have beta-1 receptor cells on the myocardial, beta-1 receptor subtypes on the myocardial cells of the heart. And when they're stimulated by norepinephrine or epinephrine, it increases contractility of the heart. So you're going to get a stronger squeeze, and that's going to increase cardiac output. Two things you want if you're in a fight or flight situation. But if you have high blood pressure or, some, or uh, you have tachycardia or high uh, heart rate, you don't want that effect. So you can blunt that effect by taking a beta blocker. And beta blockers are one of the most prescribed drugs out there. So there's a lot of them. We're gonna kind of look at a few of the most commonly prescribed ones. So uh, that as well as um, on our juxtaglomerular cells. So these are the cells that are kind of hovering around the afferent arterial uh, at, the, at the entrance of the nephron and the kidneys and they play a key role in our blood pressure maintenance. So if blood pressure is low coming in to that, from that renal artery into the kidney, these JG cells get stimulated to release renin, and then renin increases blood pressure. So if you're taking a beta blocker, that's specifically beta-1, because these are the ones that are in the heart, both the nodal cells and the contractile cells, as well as the cells that kind of determine our blood pressure in our kidneys. If you block all of those, you're gonna have a, a pretty pronounced effect on decreasing blood pressure and de decreasing cardiac output, which may be um, something you wanna do as well. So two drugs that are, are selective, they have effects on other subtypes, but they really strongly target beta-1 adrenergic receptors are metoprolol and atenolol. There's other ones. One, one thing that's kind of neat, there's a, there's a ton of beta blockers, and they all kind of end in OL, OL. But uh, what's neat is these ones that are beta-1 selective all start from A to M. Like, you know, all of them kind of fall into that category. And then the ones that kind of have beta-1 and beta-2 activity all start at like N and go to Z. So uh, that's one way to kind of keep up with which ones are beta-1 and which ones kind of have both beta-1 and beta-2. So, beta-2, these are found in the bronchial smooth muscle as well as we talked about the blood vessels. So, beta-1 always causes contraction when it's um, activated by the sympathetic nervous system. Beta-2 always causes relaxation when it's activated by the uh, sympathetic nervous system. 
So if act, um, what it does here is when you have norepinephrine and epinephrine released onto the beta-2 cells of the smooth muscle of the bronchioles in the lungs, it's going to dilate them and increase your airflow. So you're going to be able to get more oxygen in and more delivery of oxygen to your muscles and your heart. So um, that's, that makes sense. You want to vasodilate those blood vessels to your muscles, your heart, your brain. So um, all of this is going to be activated by the sympathetic nervous system. Another thing, just because it has a medical application, is that the ciliaris muscle of the eye, the ciliaris muscle is the, it's the one that determines your lens shape. If you're trying to look far away, your lens will flatten out. And if you're trying to read something up close, that ciliaris muscle will contract and it'll cause the lens to become more globular where it can focus more up close. But it also, the ciliaris muscle also makes aqueous humor. And so when um, the sympathetic nervous system stimulates beta-2 receptors on the ciliaris muscle, it also causes stimulation of more aqueous humor and increases intraocular pressure of the, of the eye. So we have some drugs that will um, affect both beta-1 and beta-2. Um, timolol, this one is the one that's associated with the ciliaris muscle. So this is a topical um, drug, so it won't have effects throughout the body so much. But what it'll do is it'll um, specifically bind and block beta-2 receptors, and this will prevent aqueous humor production, which is beneficial if someone has glaucoma. So that will be a good treatment for, for glaucoma. Now, propranolol, it has several um, indications. I want to discuss maybe two of them here. So um, beta-2, remember, it's going to cause dilation of blood vessels. So we have cerebral blood vessels that, um, when stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, dilate and increase blood flow to the brain. Now, if someone's having recurrent migraines, they can take propranolol as a prophylactic drug to decrease the number of them and intensity of them because this would ca cause a little bit of a squeeze on those, uh, those cerebral blood vessels and prevent as much blood flow going into those areas that when stimulated can, can sensitize pain receptors and cause that in intense migraine. So that's one use of propranolol. Another prophylactic use of propranolol is that say someone has, um, they've, they've been an alcoholic and they end up getting cirrhosis of the liver where there's just scarring all through the liver. When that happens, they have increased portal uh, blood pressure. So it's called portal hypertension. And in those situations, um, it, can be a, it, it can lead to a, um, a rupture of the esophageal veins and it's called esophageal varices. And so when they rupture, you have this, this really um, intense upper GI bleed, and that can be a life-threatening situation. So uh, that's if someone has portal hypertension, you can put a little bit of a squeeze on those vessels in the, that pass through the liver, and it decreases the blood flow and decreases the, the amount of that uh, tension on the esophageal veins. So that's another use for that. So um, going back to the beta ones, so we, we talked about how um, if you block beta one, you can have a, um, a good benefit on hypertension. So you can use the beta blockers are used a lot for hypertension. Um, and also if somebody has supraventricular tachycardia, so above the ventricles are your atria. So if you have any kind of um, tachycardia involving the atria, so either atrial fibrillation, where you know the atria is just kind of going off in all places, it doesn't have that nice sensation, or atrial flutter, where you just have even more uh, kind of ectopic foci throughout the, the atria. This will just kind of help slow that down and decrease the effects of that. Also, say someone had a myocardial infarction or a, or a heart attack, and they have um, after a heart attack, there's all kinds of uh, remodeling that tries to take place of the heart. And this remodeling, the more it remodels, the more it um, increases mortality risk or the risk of dying. So we actually have beta-1 
uh, receptors on the juxtamalar cells and then also on the heart. And all these come into play here because if you can attenuate that, um, that uh, propensity of the body trying to increase uh, blood pressure and all this stuff, you can decrease that um, remodeling. And when I say remodeling, I'm talking about um, dilated cardiomyopathy where the ventricles get real dilated and they, don't, um, they get real thin. Um, and it's almost in, it kind of combines with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the, it, the muscle gets real thick. And both situations are uh, deleterious to the heart. And that cardiac remodeling can be um, reduced significantly with um, beta-1 spe uh, specific drugs with like heart failure. So a lot of times when somebody has a myocardial inf infarction, their ejection fraction decreases and they have heart failure, but this will help kind of decrease the oxygen demand on the heart, decrease the remodeling uh, process that's negative on the heart, decrease blood pressure, all these things would help in that situation. So I know that was a lot, but um, this the, the androgenic act antagonists are a big drug class, so it, it's nice to kind of go into detail. Now there is a beta-3, but we're not going to talk about it here because there's no androgenic antagonist involved there, but on the on our video with the androgenic agonist, we do talk about a drug there um, as well. So.